This evening, you probably see on your note sheet that we are supposed to be in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Daniel chapter 3 is not where uh, I want you to turn. Turn one more page to Daniel chapter 4. And then that'll start us and then we'll end in Ephesians chapter 2. In the meantime, we're going to talk about the 15th century. Let's pray together and... uh, Then we'll get started. Father, thank you for the chance to gather together on a Wednesday night. We pray right now for our children and students especially. God, we pray that the word of God that they are ingesting would have its effect. We pray that that effect would be to turn their hearts toward Christ. We pray for young souls that right now are here. God, we ask you to do a miracle, to work in their hearts. God, we pray for our students that face so much every single day. We lift them to you and we pray that you might instill in them a faithfulness and a courage, a love for God, love for others, desire for the word. God, we pray that you would help us as we look uh, back at history and we see how you have worked all things together and help us to rejoice in that and to be strengthened by the truth that you work all things together. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 3, you have the story of the fiery furnace and they come out of that fine, the Hebrew children do. Daniel chapter 4 is when Nebuchadnezzar, who is an unreasonable man by any accounts, He's having a dream. He can't figure it out. He calls everybody to come and interpret this dream, and nobody can interpret the dream. It is not a good dream. I'm guessing that people don't interpret it because they know it ain't good. You get to Daniel chapter 4, and uh, it's interesting to me. Daniel 4 has Nebuchadnezzar speaking in the first person. It's like he wrote this right here. But you read it, uh, Daniel 3 and 4 is like that. And he gives the description of the vision. I'll just pick it up. It's a long story, but I'll just pick it up in verse 13. Let's go through that and let that be the setup for looking back at history. Verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in my bed and behold a watcher. A holy one came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and he said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beast and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's And let a beast mind be given to him. Let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision of the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whom he will. He sets over it the lowliest. Of men. So that's the dream. Uh, Daniel comes in and does the interpretation and tells him, hey, look, this is you, and it is really bad for you. You pick the story back up down the page at verse 28. This is what happened. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at a time of 12 months. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. You'll be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. 
Seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. He gives it, second time, to whoever he wills. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. Driven out from among men, he ate grass like an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. I guess it was matted together. His nails were like bird's claws. And at the end of the day, you see the first person? I, I, I guess he's dictating. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised, the honor, praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the most of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, my splendor returned to me. My counselors and lords, they sought me. I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the honor, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right, his ways are just. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now, there are a lot of lessons in there that you can take personally. There is one overarching theme that helps when you read this story and helps us when we live in this world. And that is that the history of the world is the history of God. God does what He wants. God puts leaders in place whether we like it or not, he puts evil leaders in place. There's a certain measure of comfort in that. Now go back in your mind. We're going to go back, go back to our lesson last week dealing with the 14th century and coming out of that, the Western world. When I say Western world, I mean Western Europe, really the whole globe, but Western Europe is where we were last week dealing with Wycliffe. The Western world is recovering from the Black Death. About 40% of the population, remember, 40% of the population died. Think about that now. Over half, or close to half, and some say 60% are gone. Villages, whole villages, gone. After that happens, there's the first hint, the very first hint of a working class. Now, there's not a middle class at all in the 15th century, but you have the first hint of having something beyond royalty and serfs. While that's swirling around, swirling around, so many people have died, that for the first time you have this vocalized doubt about God. Doubt about His effectiveness. Doubts about the church. There's even murmurings about, uh, about royalty. I'm reading a book right now uh, about King George the... Fifth. King George V was uh, the king during uh, World War I. Good friends with Winston Churchill, who would lead in World War II. Uh, but King George V was a king when monarchies were falling. You go and read Russian history, the Russian Revolution, and the Tsar is deposed and then killed. And all throughout Eastern Europe and all throughout Europe, Kings are falling, and George V was worried about the kingdom. Worried that that's going to go over there to him. And that starts rumbling, and people start questioning authority. You have what we might call a revolution. The French experienced it after we did, and America was born. One of the overarching things we want to hold on to is that the history of the world is the history of God. It's God doing it. Now, to get through this um, tonight, I just picked out ten. You see the paper? I got ten figures from history, and I want to just walk through them. Or maybe I have nine. I can't remember. Maybe it's ten. 
You might remember when we talked about John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was the morning star of the Reformation. He was not a reformer, but he was the morning star of the Reformation. He died, but a lightning bolt struck in the form of the Wycliffe Bible. You have that there on your page. The Wycliffe Bible is a Bible that's translated from Latin into English. It came from the Latin Vulgate into English, and Wycliffe did most of it. Those that were with him after he died, they finished that project. Every single copy of that Bible was copied by hand. It might take you, like there were monks at Lindisfarne that would write the Bible. It, a, a, a monk might be able in his lifetime to make three copies. In the Wycliffe Bible, that um, English translation of the Latin Bible, he came up with 1,100 new English words. That Bible would be the dominant English translation for another 150 years and would be a tool in the hand of people that started believing in Christ alone. Uh, in England, when, when the Bible was discovered, so Wycliffe translated most of it and his followers after he died, translated the rest, and uh, would smuggle it into England. And there in England, it was banned. So the English Bible was banned in England in the 15th century. The problem with banning a book is if you ban it, it makes everybody want to read it. So you have this banned book, the Bible, and everybody wants to read it, and people start reading. Literacy levels start to rise in England. Now, this is the 14th, 15th century. If you were found with the book, if you were found with the Bible, a copy of it, and it's on vellum, it's on animal skins, if you were found with it, they would tie it around your neck. If you were fined, first you'd be fined. If you found again with it, tie it around your neck and burn you with the Bible. It was not a good thing to have a Bible, but it raised the affection for literacy and started making sense. People started thinking. There's a group of men that uh, traveled with Wycliffe and even outlived him. We talked about them last week, the Lollards. We think they were called, they were preachers. We think they were called Lollards as a, uh, as something to make fun of them, a derision, because it sounds like they're la, la, la. I think they're making fun of them preaching. They really shouted a lot, but they preached with the Wycliffe Bible and the, the Lollards, they were radicals. This is what Bible reading does to you. It makes you a radical. Look, you sit in this room right now. <clears throat> if you believe what the Bible says, you, your beliefs are radical. The most liberal person in this room, theologically now I'm talking, is a radical because of what you believe about the Bible. People started reading it and started believing it, and uh, the Lollards were preaching it, and if you preach in that day and time, you know, you have one church as the Catholic Church. And if you're preaching and not in the Catholic Church, then you're going to be persecuted. Well, these Lollards, they were reading the Bible and finding all this stuff that they didn't know. And as they're reading it, they started writing commentaries. The Wycliffe, you can Google it right now, Wycliffe Commentaries. They started writing comment on the Bible so that it would help people understand it because you think about a a church person that's grown up in the church that's never actually held a Bible in her hands and starts to read it, it could be very confusing. And so the Lollards were giving commentaries. They really were a movement. Now, this is 100 years before the Protestant Reformation. Uh, they were explaining what the Bible said. They were very brave. They came up with 12, the Lollards had 12 conclusions. Remember um, Martin Luther and the 95 Theses, nailing them on the door, we'll get to that. Another time, but before Martin Luther did the 95 Theses, the Lollards, first they had 12, uh, they had 12 conclusions, and I'm like, well, that's not enough. Then they come up with 37 conclusions, and they even uh, petitioned Parliament with these conclusions to say, uh, this is what people should live. Let me tell you a couple of them. I won't go through all of them. A couple of conclusions from reading the Bible. They said that... Uh, the church should not be involved in the state. Now, they didn't, they didn't come up with the separation of church and state, 
But they were convinced that clergy, that the Pope had no business running anything in the state. He didn't need to be best friends with the king. That was one of their conclusions. Another conclusion was um, the ordination ceremonies that they did in the Catholic Church. The ordination ceremonies for priests were without scriptural basis and should not be. This is what happens when you read the Bible. You start saying, okay, is this a, in line with the Bible? So they're reading the Bible and they're like, this is not scriptural. Uh, they, early on, were against um, priest celibacy. Priests not getting married. Their conclusion was that if a priest doesn't get married, he's more likely to be homosexual. This is what they, they actually said it worse. That you, they fall into, or um, another conclusion they came up with was that uh, transubstantiation. You've heard... Uh, I think Rick talked about transubstantiation, that the wafer and the wine both become the body and the blood, turn into the actual. And the Lollard said that transubstantiation would lead to idolatry. So this sounds a lot like the reformers a hundred years before. They said praying for the dead is not biblical. Um, confession, confession to a priest is not biblical. God alone forgives sin in Christ. Confess it to God. That's, that's the Lollards. So you have Wycliffe, then you have the Wycliffe translation. The Lollards get a hold of that Bible. They start preaching it. And that notion skips over the English Channel into the continent, goes all the way to Copenhagen. And you find there a man named John Huss. John Huss. I'll go quickly through John Huss. He's a fascinating man. Bohemia. Uh, July the 6th, 1415, John Huss is tied to a stake, the most powerful preacher of his age. He is John Huss, the most powerful preacher of his age. He'd been condemned to death. The thing about condemning John Huss to death is everybody in Prague knows him, knows he's the most powerful preacher that they've ever heard. It was his preaching that got him in such trouble at Bethlehem Church there in Prague. There, in fact, if you go to Prague, I haven't been there, but I've read about it. There is a monument to John Huss. The prelate at uh, Bethlehem Church, the, the, the man over the church, they, he wanted preaching in the church, and John Huss was a brilliant man. He's still a Catholic, didn't have any ideas. He had these Protestant leanings. And Huss starts preaching, and it's his preaching. People have never heard that. I remember, do you remember the first time you heard preaching? Like I grew up in a really, uh, I grew up in a really liberal, theologically liberal church. And I never heard uh, the Bible preached. And we went to visit some friends one time in Roanoke, Virginia. In fact, I'm going to preach at that church in November. The very first Baptist church I've ever been in, in my life. And uh, we walked into that church, and a man stood up and opened a Bible and just pre And it's mesmerizing. It was to me. I was 15 years old. And I knew that's what, whatever kind of church this is, that's the kind of preacher I want to be. Well, well John Huss stood and preached, and people have never heard this kind of thing in that quiet church, cut against the grain so hard. And he did so with the Bible. In fact, he, he believed that the Bible needed to be in the hands of people, so he translated it into Czech. Well, because of that, he's condemned to die. So the Pope gets word of this, and the people in Prague love John Huss. He's a great preacher. The Pope says, nope, he's a heretic. And so the Pope, people say, no, we're not going to give him up. The Pope wants him to come there. And the people are like, we're not giving him up. And the Pope puts on that city an interdict. That means is... Churches can't open. People can't be baptized. Now think about being a Catholic. You, you, gotta, you, gotta, you need to baptize that baby if you want it to go to heaven. People can't be baptized. They can't receive last rites. They can't have funerals. They can't receive the mass. If you can't receive the mass, if, if, you're, if you go by the Catholic theology, if you can't receive the mass, you, you are not saved. The Pope shuts it down and forces them to give him up. He moves out. He gets out of town. The Holy Roman Emperor, which is not the Pope, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, in Europe, 
sets a trial for John Huss and guarantees, I guarantee you, safe conduct. If you'll come. Well, of course, you know that's, that's going to be a trick. Because John Huss believed that every believer is actually a part of the church, whether they take the mass or not. Every believer. That the Bible is the sole authority and, and Christ is the head of the church. You see, not a man. If, if you preach Christ alone, what you're saying is that the Pope has no real authority. So those flames, they lit flames, took them three times. They want to make sure the day they burned John Huss, um, tied him to the post and stacked all the wood up. And at uh, one point he, he told the executioner, come around here. I, w- I want to see the flame that's going to burn in front of me. Don't light it behind me. And um, it took him three times. I don't know why the fire was going out. To, uh, they, they wanted to burn him up real, like a whole lot. They didn't want any pieces laying around. They wanted to burn him up. So they kept burning him. They dug three feet around the pole, dug up the dirt that was under him that they burned, and threw he and all of that into the Rhine. People were mad back then, burning, burning folks. But John Huss, the flames that caught fire on John Huss would begin to burn. You see, a German, a German monk named Martin Luther, we talked about this last week uh, just a little bit. A German monk named Martin Luther, when John Huss said, you're going to cook this goose, but there's sw- a swan will rise. A German monk named Martin Luther becomes that swan. John Huss, uh, he translated the Bible into the Czech language for his people. He condemned the Pope. Became a, model for, became a model for the Reformation, but there's always something missing. There's something missing. Okay, so let's put this aside. Why is the Pope so strong now? Why, why is it that he can actually make things happen here in the 15th century? Well, the problem for Protestants will be that there is an end now to the papal schism. I say papal For years, there were two popes and then three popes. We talked about it last week, excommunicating one another. Finally, the Avignon Pope, the one that was in France during the Hundred Years' War, there's a pope in France. Remember, England and France are always fighting one another. And uh, the pope there in France made the English angry, and so they continued to, to fight. They had another pope in Rome, and then a third showed up. I can't even remember where he was. But the papal schism, papal schism ended when the Pope went back to Rome. And when he went back to Rome in the 15th century, that's when the Vatican City was established. A lot of people think that the Vatican City has been there since Peter or been there for 2,000 years. It has not. 1500 is when the Vatican City was established. And in the Vatican City, uh, that's not where the cathedral, the chair for the Pope is. It's in another church. I've forgotten that, the name of that church. But he goes back there and establishes the strength of the, of the Pope. And from that moment forward, it will continue to grow, but from that moment forward, you have the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. Now, if the Pope is infallible, he's infallible when he's sitting in his chair and makes a decree. If the Pope is infallible and you cross the Pope, it is a really big problem. If you're in this church and cross me, nobody cares. If you cross the Pope, you're crossing God, was the thought. And so you live under that iron umbrella. There are some good things that come out. Uh, Thomas Akempis. Thomas Akempis wrote the, a book that has been published more times than any other book in the history of books except the Bible. And that is the imitation of Christ. The imitation of Christ is a, is a devotional book. It is filled with Catholic theology. However, his, his practical applications for a life of practical holiness, if you can read that without, without getting snagged by uh, a works-based salvation, if you can see his, his understanding of the closeness of Jesus, He's still very, very Catholic. We wouldn't, we wouldn't recognize some of the theology, 
But when you read the, the day-to-day remembering of the closeness, the, the intimacy of Christ. With the end of the with the end of the schism, and now you got one pope back in Rome, Vatican City's getting strong. Uh, the Pope would harden and strengthen as we walk through the 15th century. Let's lay that aside and let's go to France. There we meet a young woman named Joan of Arc. A lot of mystery around Joan of Arc. Uh, There are layers and layers that have now covered the real story of who she is. 17 years old, a, a young lady, a girl. Born in, four, born in 1412, died in 1431. Her life was uh, right there at the end of the Hundred Years' War. As the story goes, she had visions uh, of victory and of King Charles and told enough people that she was brought into the presence of King Charles of France. I, I don't know how that worked. Like I, it, I could have visions and I can't get close to the governor. I say, look, I'm having visions about the governor. They're not going to take me to the governor. They're going to take me to a jail cell. But Joan of Arc, they brought to King Charles. And King Charles, because uh, the, the battles ebb and flow, there's always one going on. If you have 100 years of war, it's not like they're fighting constantly for 100 years. It's on and off. And he sends Joan of Arc to the Battle of Orleans, is what she's known for. And they win. The French beat the English and run them out of there. Now, the English have a certain amount of claim on that side of the channel, on the French side of the channel. She doesn't have many more victories, though. By the time she's 19, she's tried it a couple of times like that and lost. Uh, She's captured in Burgundy by the uh, Burgundians, I guess, and they hand her over to the English. And in Normandy, a lot happens in Normandy. In Normandy, she's tried for heresy. What did she do wrong? The three things was she, she dressed like a man. This is the, this is the heresy. It's what she's charged with. Be, dressing like a man, that she had demonic visions. She was charged. Your Catholic preacher just charged. Demonic visions. And, now this is the English that are doing this. And uh, not submitting to the church. But pretty soon after that, uh, the charges, after they, of course, burn her up, they thought they had second thoughts. It would be good if they could do that before they put people to the stake. Had second thoughts and thought, you know, we've made a mistake here. And so absolved her of all of those things. And by 1900, it takes 500 years, 1900, she's made a saint. And she becomes, I mean, we remember her name. Think about how many people do you remember from the 15th century? Joan of Arc. It's interesting, it's a, it's a swirling, like just think of history, it's a swirling time in, in Europe and in England. It's, an inter- it's, a, it's a time of mysticism. A, a young lady has a vision and you put her in front of the army. Thomas Akempis with the imitation of Christ. Over on the continent you have John Huss being burnt up because he's, it's, it's like they're scratching not quite the, to the scratching. All of that changes with the Gutenberg Press. Gutenberg Press and the Bible absolutely changed the course of history, the course of religion. If you had dates, you would put 1440 to 1455 or so. Uh, there's a German... Goldsmith, I've been to his house, and I've seen the press. Uh, a German goldsmith, Johann Gutenberg, he invented the printing press. Now, when I think about the printing press, he's really going to be put, putting some out. It, it's not like running a Xerox machine. The printing press uh, printed, printed the Gutenberg Bible, and he printed 200 Bibles in three years, which doesn't sound very fast, but when you think about Bibles up to that very moment were actually handwritten. Have you, you ever tried uh, the journals, the Deuteronomy 17, 18 journals, and, and copy the Bible? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's laborious. And most of the Bibles had really good, I mean, I, I copy the Bible and I can't read what I've written because my handwriting's so bad. Really good writing. 
So the, um, the Bibles are 200 of them made in three years, which is an amazing speed. And it changed the way information traveled. It is said, this is a legend, legend, that when Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the Church of Wittenberg, when he did that, he did that on October 31st, 1517. It's coming up. If we were good Protestants, we'd, we'd celebrate Reformation Day and not Halloween. But we won't do that. But we're coming up on October the 31st, 1517. And uh, it, it is said that in 17 days that there were prints of that in the streets of London. Now, I don't know if that's true, but the Gutenberg Press changed everything. You know why? Think about Wycliffe, how he died and they dug him up and, and, and burned him, had a trial for him. Think about John Huss, how he died and it was kept in one corner. The Gutenberg Press and the Gutenberg Bible, that, that German translation after the Gutenberg Bible, Martin Luther will make a German translation and the German translation that Martin Luther will make in the next century, he sold 5,000 copies in two weeks. Now think about when it first started, 200 or 300 in two years. Francis Bacon, who lived much later uh, and not a Christian at all, Francis Bacon would look back on history and say that the two inventions that forever changed the world were gunpowder and the printing press. And that's the truth. Praise God for the luxury of the Bible you have here. Praise God for, for the printing press, God working in history to make the Reformation possible. The Reformation is not possible without. I mean, the Waldensians tried it in the 12th century, and then the Lollards, and then John Huss. They don't have a way to get the information out. God provided the printing press. And after that, Martin Luther would use it. Now, we've been in, we've been in Europe. Let's take a, a moment. Uh, we talked about England and talked about uh, the continent. Uh, let's go further into the east. Something monumental and cataclysmic happens in the 15th century that changed the face of Christianity, that changed the face of nations, and that is the fall of of a place called Constantinople. Now, it's important to, to think, why is Constantinople important? Why, why is it necessary to talk? Why is this important? Well, just very quickly, in 330 A.D., uh, Constantine, who is the new Roman emperor, he was crowned emperor in York, uh, in England. So the new emperor, he's a Christian, and he founds a new Rome in what is now Istanbul, Constantine. It is at the crossroads of, of Asia and, and Europe. It's important because with that founding, the power shifts from Italy, Rome. The Roman power shifts. It's a good thing it did because a hundred years later, in 410 AD, the Visigoths sack Rome in Italy, Alaric is there. And for a thousand years, the people in Constantinople considered themselves Romans. Now, they weren't in Rome. They would call themselves Latins. And there in Constantinople, the Church of Rome would become the Eastern Orthodox Church that would end in a division in 1054, I think, the division. And that church would be remarkably different than the Catholic Church, and actually, if you press the issue a little bit, even closer to where we are as Protestants. As odd as it, if you've ever been in an in a Eastern Orthodox Church, it will feel different, but if you look underneath the field, you'll see some pretty significant similarities. So the Eastern Orthodox Church is there in, in uh, Constantinople, and for a thousand years... You have Christendom. For a thousand years, you have Rome in the east until May 29, 1453. May 29, 1453, after a 53-day siege, 
the city collapsed. Constantinople collapsed. The Roman Empire finally collapsed under the, the Ottomans, the Turks. The Ottomans um, were Muslims that have already swept over most of what we know to be Palestine. They had gotten into Spain. They had pressed almost all the way to France, and they had taken over Jerusalem and Israel, and finally, it took them a long time to do it. I mean, they've been trying 700 years. It took a long time to do it, and finally, Rome falls, and it's gone. Most scholars say this is, the, this is such a cataclysmic event that right there is the end of the Middle Ages. It's certainly the end of the Roman Empire. Now, Charlemagne called himself the Holy Roman Emperor, and that will run on for, uh, you know, a thousand years or so, but that's not really Rome. Here you have this terrible blow to Christendom. The wonderful church built in the, in the 500s, the Hagia Sophia, becomes a mosque. The Crusades never worked, but it, it was so uh, monumental that the, the people in, in Western Europe wanted to start another crusade. Well, when Constantinople fell, there was trouble brewing back over there in merry old England. Let's go back there. Bring it close to an end. And that is the War of the Roses. The War of the Roses. You probably have heard the phrase before, the War of the Roses. I think there was a movie made in like the 80s or 90s, uh, the War of the Roses. Uh, you can read it over and over. It's really difficult to actually get a handle on what is going on with the War of the Roses. You have two roses, a white one and a red one, two families, Lancaster, Lancaster, and the Yorks. Lancaster and the Yorks. And a broad way of saying is, those two roses, one is red, one is white, York, Lancaster, are fighting. They, and they fight for near a century. The fight ends up um, at the Battle of uh, Bowerfield. The fight ends up, and Henry VII, it's important you get the numbers right, Henry VII, Emerges as the victor. He becomes king, Henry VII. He is of the house of Lancaster. He marries, as a way of bringing the Civil War down to a close, he marries Elizabeth of York. That legitimizes him because he's a usurper. He marries Elizabeth of York. And then what you have is the white rose and the red rose come together to give us the Tudor. T-U-D-O-R, the Tudor Rose. You can look it up. That Tudor Rose will be the symbol of Henry VIII. Now, Henry VII, let's back up a little bit. Henry VII, he needs some legitimacy. He needs somebody to make him feel like he actually does deserve this throne. His uh, wife that he's married, it has settled everything down because the Lancasters and the Yorks are now patched up. The Hatfields and McCoys there in England is patched up. And now they're having children. Henry VII has a couple of sons. His first son he named after King Arthur. So Arthur is born. He is a weakly child. But we get him to about 16 or 17. We need to find a bride for him pretty quickly. Spain is a really powerful place. He convinces the king and queen in Spain, Isabella and Ferdinand, to marry uh, their daughter. Now, this woman, Catherine, is a formidable, she will be a formidable woman. She's raised to be a queen by Isabella, who is another formidable woman. And Catherine comes to England and marries this young, sickly boy, Arthur, and promptly Arthur dies. Arthur's gone. Henry VII doesn't want to let this woman, Catherine, this young lady, she's just barely a teenager, or just barely beyond being a teen, 18 or 19. He thought of marrying her himself. His wife had died. He's an old man. He was dreaming. She was out of his league, but she was there. But he thought, you know, it's probably not a good idea. I do have this, this, this wild son, Henry. He sh Henry was never supposed to be the king. 
Never. It happened so often. George V, never supposed to be the king. Henry's made first in line to the throne. They work it out that he can marry Catherine. Catherine, the Pope tried to stop it. Uh, but they worked it out they could marry Catherine. He could, wasn't supposed to because she had been married to his brother. And church law said, you can't marry your brother's wife. So the Pope finally said, oh, you know what, a special dispensation. You guys have had a hard time. They get married. Catherine of Argon, I mentioned she was a formidable young lady. She, a formidable woman raised to be a queen understood the, the, the way power works. She was unable to have a son. She could have a daughter, though. She was fiercely Catholic. So was Henry VIII when he married her. Henry VIII, I'll make a long story short because it's a, it's a, it's a terrible story. Henry VIII will finally divorce Catherine, although the Catholic Church never recognizes it. He does so, and the English Church, the Anglican Church, the Church of England is established and out of the Church of England, we can draw our, our spiritual roots, at least in, in part. The Church of England will produce Puritans who want to purify the church, and then those that are frustrated with every bit of that, the dissenters that will for a while flee to Holland. They'll see those Anabaptists doing their thing and think, yeah, that's probably a good way to do it, and end up producing Baptist. The War of the Roses is really part, at least a rivulet of our history. That's going on in England. While that's happening, you have Christopher Columbus who has been sort of canceled. Christopher Columbus is canceled now. But he is a part of world history and a part of God's history and a part of Christian history. Christopher Columbus is there in Spain. Remember, Spain now is a formidable power. You've got Isabella um, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand, and they are, they are really something. I mean, go and read the story of Spain. Uh, the, the, the Muslims have been in Spain 700 years. Isabella and Ferdinand run them out. I mean, they are determined. Anyway, so they, they fight the Muslims, run them out, and um, Christopher Columbus, he's an explorer, and he goes in front of the king and queen, he asked for permission, and um, they give him permission, give him the finances trip. And Christopher Columbus partly, partly called a mission, the first one to do it. Starts the colonization. Didn't, doesn't get all the way here to North America. Uh, gets close. Plants the flag with a cross on it. That planting of the flag with a cross on it. It was good and bad. Because remember, Isabella and uh, Ferdinand, was they pushed, pushed the Muslims out. The Jews could stay if they were convert. convert. If they'll convert, you can stay. You've got three months to do it, and if not, we have something called the Inquisition and a man named Torquemada. Go look him up. He's not a good guy. The Inquisition is a terrible way. You, you can't force people to convert, but that's what they were doing. So you have some of that, then some, a lot of things to actually respect. Then you have the growing canopy of we're calling what we're doing for Christianity. Like I'm going to Ecuador in a couple of weeks and there the conquistadors would come through a couple hundred years later and call what they're doing Christian. To have this double side of a coin that, that shows us where religion without actual compassion and truth in Christ, without Christ... becomes an issue. So the 15th century, uh, 16th, what century are we doing? 15th century is coming to a close, uh, 1492, you know that date, Christopher Columbus. Uh, let's put him aside just for a moment and end it in Florence, Italy. There in Florence, Italy is a man that is, could be, uh, he could be some backwoods Pentecostal preacher. Savonarola, Savonarola, Savonarola. You can probably uh, read about him. You can see, uh, I think there's a movie out about him somewhere. 1452 to 1498, he's a priest in Florence, Italy. 
he is a, a, a priest with indignation at, at the lack of morality. The uh, Medicis in Italy have taken over. They're bankers. They're getting rich. They're still within the Catholic Church. And he's preaching fire and moral reform. He's preaching the authority of the Bible. He, he's getting so close to the gospel. In fact, Martin Luther will look back on um, Savonarola and say he was so close. John Calvin was so, he would say, he's so close, but there was something missing. He's the one, uh, we have the phrase, uh, bonfire of the vanities. You've heard that phrase before. It comes from this man's preaching. He had uh, young men that would come with him. You know, everybody's attracted to a radical, and they would go through the town and get all of the things that were not God-honoring. So any cosmetics, anything that was vain, any book, lipstick, mirrors, curtains, and put them in a pile and set fire to them, and that became the bonfire, the bonfire of the vanities. But what that wasn't, what it wasn't was Christianity. More reform without genuine conversion is dead. This is what Paul says. Let's see if we can read it and finish out in Ephesians chapter 2. This is the hope of the gospel. And the hope that we can hold on to. And thank God that he worked history to the degree that we live in a time where eyes are being opened. Paul writes, you were dead in the trespasses of your sins. In which you once walked following the course of this world. You followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work, at work now in the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, He's made us alive together with Christ. It's by grace you have been saved, raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He did that so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. So that no one will boast. We are his workmanship you are created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared beforehand that we can walk in them. One thing missing from all those ten was the gospel, the saving power of the gospel. And we look back and thank God for the gospel. To join me as we close, time of prayer. Thank God for being the God of history. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness, that you brought us up in a time where we could hear the gospel. That you gave us Bibles to read, to, that we could hear from you. That you sent someone into our lives to explain the gospel, then you awakened us to it. Thank you for that. Father, we pray that you would wake us up in enough time tomorrow to take advantage of the luxury of reading your word. We ask that you put people and circumstances on our hearts to lift to you in prayer. That you strengthen our faith, that you comfort our hearts, that you make us useful for the kingdom, that you would bring us back on Sunday as men and women in need. Bring us back to worship and fellowship and sing and see Christ. We thank you for his death on the cross and for the resurrection. And it's in that power we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.